If I could ask uh, John Flavin to uh, come up and start the program rolling, John. A native of Downers Grove, Illinois, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And thanks, Jay. I am honored to be here. There's an exciting transformation occurring on the south side of Chicago today. Mm -hmm. At the Polsky Center, we are launching new businesses at the University of Chicago and in our surrounding neighborhood. And we're home to a thriving and very diverse entrepreneurial community. But Chicago and Illinois are still living in an economic crisis. Nearly a decade after the Great Recession started, we're still struggling to fund our pensions, stabilize our healthcare system, and agree on a budget. At the root of these problems is a stagnating economic engine, an engine that must be rebuilt if we are to properly fund the social programs that result in greater income equality and improve the lives of the disenfranchised. So what's the University of Chicago's role in all this? This week, the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition will be releasing data showing that our universities here in the state and the two national labs that the university manages, Argonne National Laboratories and Fermilab, are responsible for nearly a quarter of all research and development spending in this state. That's more than $3.3 billion. And unlike corporate investments in R&D, academic investments are gaining momentum growing by 2.6% from 2014 to 2015, compared to just 2.2% nationally. It's the only area where Illinois growth is outpacing national growth. And that's why we matter. Through the Polsky Center, the university's investments in research are laying the groundwork for new tools and new companies. A new engine that increasingly will power the region forward for the next century. Now my father was a product of the old industrial engine. For 37 years, he worked at the classic Chicago company, Inland Steel. My dad's in the room, he's not old, just Inland Steel was old. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad's work there was building what then defined the cutting edge, massive supercomputers like the one you may have seen in the movie Hidden Figures. So many aspects of my dad's professional life are gone. Inland Steel itself is gone. And no one spends 40 years at the same company anymore. Meanwhile, I'm getting calls from a lot of friends and colleagues along the lines of, I've been laid off. What should I do? You're a startup guy. Maybe I should start a business. How do I get started? Now my journey for its era was quite unusual. From the day that I graduated from Marquette, I was a biotech entrepreneur, working with my brother Mike, a chemist, on a drug discovery company we founded called Medichem Life Sciences. We took Medichem public in 2000 and later sold it to Decode Genetics for $84 million in 2002. And we did it again, went right back at it. We IPO'd a second company, Advanced Life Sciences in 2005. At the time of the sale of Medichem to Decode, there were fewer than 10 publicly traded biotech and pharmaceutical companies here in Illinois. That remains the case today, 15 years later. And frankly, it makes me angry. While we no doubt experienced enormous success as entrepreneurs, there's nothing quite like seeing your company's name lit up in Times Square on NASDAQ. I gotta tell you, we also wrote out crisis after crisis alone. For example, in the early days, our landlord evicted us due to the foul odors emanating from our laboratory. <laughs> then later on, a fire, literally, burned out one of the buildings in our business, a core part of the operation. It's always the chemist to blame, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Business guys, just stay focused. <laughs> and later on, much further in our development, far down the path, 
having done two IPOs, we took a drug all the way to FDA approval, spending $200 million in 10 years of our lives to get that antibiotic to market, only to be told that due to regulatory changes, we needed to do another round of clinical trials, a mandate that was insurmountable right during the Great Recession. Now these are the FDA reviewers up here. The guy in the middle with that funny mustache uh, was the one who stood in our way of approval. And I still hate that guy. <laughs> okay? It's not even a real mustache. And he wasn't even a real statistician. But the next day was a lonely day. It was a lonely day. What to do from here? Rebuild. That's what you do. It's a process. The University of Chicago has recognized that more and more of its students' careers will look like mine, including periods in between companies. For our next generation, entrepreneurship will become the Swiss army knives of their careers. That's why, for the long-term prosperity of our community, the Polsky Center is driving the creation of new businesses at the university and on the south side. We are aggressively supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs. Last month, we announced a partnership with Wexford Science and Technology to build a 270,000 square foot laboratory and office facility for startups, companies, and venture capital firms in Hyde Park. And last year, we announced a $25 million commitment from our endowment to invest in our most successful companies. <coughs> Joining me today on stage are three entrepreneurs who represent each of the three constituencies that the Polsky Center serves. Community members, students, and faculty. So first, I'd like to introduce Maya Camille Broussard, founder of Justice of the Pies. Her entry point for gaining support from the university was through our co-working space at the Polsky Exchange. She had no prior affiliation with the university. Maya Camille, please start us off. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Maya Camille Poussard and I am the founder of Justice of the Pies, a bakery that specializes in sweet and savory pies, quiches, and tarts. <coughs> Excuse me. I created the company in 2014 in memory of my late father, Steve Poussard. My dad was a criminal defense attorney with a serious love for baking and eating pies. <laughs> So when he passed away, my cousin had the grand idea that we should start this business. And like John, I had a, um, started my entrepreneurial journey with another business that also suffered a loss. And so um, <clears throat> sometimes when you um, are a young, bright entrepreneur with your very first endeavor, you dive right in. You're extremely excited about it. But um, when something happens to the business, sometimes it's hard to get back up on the horse. And so that's where the Polsky Exchange really helped me in terms of mentorship and guidance and um, me gaining faith in uh, being an entrepreneur again. So Justice of the Pies is uh, formed as an L3C because we have a social mission to positively impact the lives of those who work with us. And we do this by working with organizations such as Dream More and Education, which provides cultural experiences for at-risk children who reside in low-income neighborhoods such as Inglewood. But because of our relationship with the Polsky Exchange, we are also looking in surrounding neighborhoods of the University of Chicago campus, such as um, Washington Park and Kenwood neighborhoods. Uh, <clears throat> so for me personally, my greatest, um, the greatest attributes that the Polsky Exchange has provided for me is my relationship with Kristen Barrett and with Alyssa uh, Cutler, who are with the, uh, the executive director of the Polsky Exchange, and Alyssa is with the Office of Civic Engagement. And these two young ladies, <laughs> young ladies, yes, I love it, uh, have been very instrumental in supporting me. And uh, key examples of this include um, Alyssa getting my pies in the Reynolds Club of 
on, on the campus of University of Chicago in introducing me to the Bon Appetit uh, team who provides the dining services, and I've developed a great relationship with them. Kristen Barrett just escorted me, literally drove me to the offices of CEO for Illuminati's Mark Agnew, and we had an amazing meeting in which I was able to gather an immense amount of information. And so as a community member of High Park and um, the surrounding university uh, neighborhoods, I found that the Polsky Exchange has provided uh, great mentorship, coaching, and connections, which have been extremely instrumental for the growth of my business as I look to expand within the Midwest region and nationally. I look forward to speaking with some of you later if you would like to learn more about Justice of the Pies or my experience with the Polsky Exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Maya Camille. And actually, what might be the highlight of today's event uh, is that she will have samples of her pies available by the door on your way out. <laughs> Caitlin Smith enrolled in our business school, Chicago Booth, to participate in its entrepreneurship program. Her company, Simple Mills, is now the largest natural baking mix company in America by revenue. Join me in welcoming Caitlin to tell us more. Good afternoon. I'm Caitlin Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Simple Mills. I started this company about five years ago after cleaning up my diet and taking out a lot of the processed food and a lot of the sugar. I realized what a huge difference it makes. My joint pain went away. I had loads more energy. My seasonal allergies went away. All these things that I never thought were related to the food that I was eating. And so it was at that time that I realized just how large the impact is, um, the food that we eat, that it can impact your immune system, that it can impact your ability to focus, anxiety, depression, all these things that we never associated with food before. So I started Simple Mills with the vision of really transforming the center aisles of the grocery store, making it easier to eat simple ingredient real food, things that you can pronounce, that you know what they are, that have vitamins and minerals and protein. Uh, so we started out as a baking mix company. So as an example, our baking mixes are made out of almond flour and sweetened with coconut sugar. Um, when I started at Chicago Booth for my MBA, I was in about, I think, five stores at the time. Uh, and it was at that time that I first met the Polsky Center and met some of the advisors uh, in that program. And through those advisors, I really started to understand just how large this company could be. And it really broadened my perspective of, of the impact that we could have. Um, in addition, I went through the New Venture Challenge uh, three years ago. Um, we we co-won uh, the competition that year. And through that process, I also really learned how to raise money and work with investors, um, skills that have been absolutely critical to get to where we are today. Um, today, we not only make baking mixes, but we make ready-to-eat crackers, um, ready-to-eat cookies, um, frostings, and you can find our products in over 8,000 stores around the country. So um, everything from Target to Whole Foods. Um, in the Midwest, we've got like Jewel, um, Treasure Island, Mariano's. Um, afterwards, you can try some of the product as well. Um, but thank you so much for having me today, and thank you to the Polsky Center for, for the huge impact that you've made on, on my business. Um, I don't think we'd be uh, where we are today without the help from, from this organization. Thank you, Caitlin. And as she mentioned, she'll also have uh, cracker samples uh, at the door on other foods as well. So thank you. And finally, I want to introduce John Colson of Closter Bio. John was a postdoctoral student at our Institute for Molecular Engineering. He has since joined the company and leads its business operations. John? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I am John Colson. I'm the Director of Operations at Closter Bio. And it's a pleasure for me to tell you about how we are creating new medicines that can prevent life-threatening allergic reactions to food. So, food allergies are a growing public health problem in the United States, and it's estimated now that as many as six million kids have a food allergy, a number that's increased as much as 50% in a generation. Now, exposure to a food can be life-threatening, and it's estimated that an accidental exposure sends a patient to the hospital or ambulatory care center once every three minutes in the United States. But despite the risk, 
These patients have no way to prevent their life-threatening allergies as there are no approved drugs to do so. Now, Cluster Bio is solving this problem by creating new medicines that could stop allergic reactions before they can actually start. These treatments, which we're formulating in an oral form, are designed to actually stop the allergen from entering the bloodstream by targeting the intestinal barrier and boosting its protective ability. This is a unique approach that should be safer and more effective than existing allergy treatments today and eliminates the harmful side effects that those patients experience. And with Cluster Bio, the fear of an accidental exposure is eliminated and patients and their caregivers should have peace of mind and control over their diet and their lifestyle. Now this groundbreaking treatment was made possible by discoveries made in Professor Kathy Nagler's lab at the University of Chicago. She discovered that our food allergies arise when the gut barrier becomes more permeable and ultimately allergens can enter the bloodstream and trigger an unhealthy immune response which we would think of as allergy. When you repair the gut barrier, this allergic sensitivity is reversed. So she partnered with Jeff Hubble who is a chemist, a material scientist, professor in the Institute for Molecular Engineering at UChicago, as well as a serial entrepreneur. And he was able to engineer and create a new synthetic drug that could mimic Kathy's discovery. And in fact, repair the intestinal barrier. Now those two discoveries are what form the core technology of Clostra Bio. And it's actually where we get our name. Clostra is the Latin word for barrier. Now they approached John and the Polsky team uh, with whom I was working as an associate with their innovation fund, as well as my postdoctoral role with the Institute for Molecular Engineering. I was able to leverage my background with the fund to help them put together a business development plan, an operational plan, as well as think about how we could get investors to put money into the company. I ultimately left my postdoc and joined the company full time and now lead its operations. Since then, the university and the Polsky Center have been committed and uh, heavily invested in our success. John was part of our first meeting when we put the team together back in 2015. We participated in other Polsky programs such as the i -Corps, and we recently received a funding award from the Innovation Fund, as well as fourth place in Chicago Booth's New Venture Challenge. We continue to work with the Polsky Center in, for, in order to, to get new intellectual property as well as license that from the university. And it's because of their success that we're now completing a second round of funding to continue our studies in peanut allergies and advance our drug to human clinical trials. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for John for the opportunity to speak today. And if you ever have any questions or want to learn more about Cluster Bio, I'm always happy to tell you about how we're ending the burden of food allergies. Thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, no samples from your company just yet? Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, Maya, Caitlin, and John. When I arrived at the university in 2014 to open a co-working space for both community and student entrepreneurs alike, the University of Chicago already had a thriving entrepreneurship program inside its Booth School of Business. In fact, the leading concentration at Chicago Booth today is not finance, it's entrepreneurship. During the past 21 years, professors Steve Kaplan and Ellen Rudnick built that program and its flagship course, the New Venture Challenge from scratch. Today, the New Venture Challenge is the top rated university startup accelerator in the country, recognized alongside other notable accelerators like Y Combinator and Techstars. Through the New Venture Challenge, the Polsky Center has spawned more than 160 active companies, including three national brands that are headquartered here in Chicago. Grubhub, which went public, Braintree, which was sold to eBay for $800 million, and now Simple Mills. Startups in this program alone have returned more than $4 billion in value to their investors and added countless jobs to the Chicago community. But here's a fact that few people know. Eric Isaacs, our, our head of research, would know this. The University of Chicago actually lays claim to more Nobel laureates in the sciences, such as chemistry and physics, than it does in economics. And until recently, those two powerhouses, one of commerce and the other of science, rarely came into contact with each other. Now, if the university was ever to become an unequivocal leader in innovation, one that can remake the re region's economy, this had to change. The university had to begin driving ideas to impact everywhere on campus, not only at the business school. 
And that's why we've built an integrated, streamlined platform for any entrepreneur, whether you're working on a new drug or a new app. Michael Polsky made this possible by investing $50 million into the Polsky Center. Now, while you can see from our entrepreneurs' stories that our portfolio is quite diverse, a range of different business verticals, I'd like to focus my remaining time on what we're doing to transform scientific discoveries into companies like Closter Bio. Its journey captures both our boldest ambitions as well as our most daunting challenges. Professor Nagler's more than three decades of research in food allergies got Closter Bio to where it is today. The next step, as John mentioned, is to build the cure. And until a few years ago, the university simply did not have the in-house talent to build the cure. We would have had to turn to a drug company or license the discovery outright to a venture capital firm on either of the coasts. That's because a seismic shift has happened at the university under President Bob Zimmer's visionary leadership. The university began investing in applied sciences, beginning with the creation of its first engineering program, the Institute for Molecular Engineering, or IME for short. The scientists at the IME are builders. They're building new drugs, new materials for solar panels, and new chemicals for water treatment and well beyond. Jeff Hubble of Closter Bio is one of them. The university recruited Jeff from Switzerland in 2014. Jeff holds 77 patents and he's a four-time entrepreneur. He has a company devoted to wound healing and another to bone repair products. Two of his companies are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts because Cambridge has the infrastructure, the entrepreneurial support system, the so-called ecosystem, to help it scale. Entrepreneurship is never easy, but it's easier for a biotech entrepreneur in Cambridge with the investments we're making his fifth company, Close to Bio, will grow and succeed here in Chicago. From the lab space to the quarter of a million dollars in cash that the university has invested in Close to Bio, we're making it easier. And not just for one company and one entrepreneur, but hundreds of them. Because a trickle of innovation won't suffice. We've got to get to critical mass. Our goal is to create a rushing river of new ideas and businesses starting and growing on the south side. This is such a big task that the University of Chicago can't do it alone. All of the state's research universities are pushing in the same direction with, believe it or not, strong collaborative tissue. And this will grow and scale over time. This is an inclusive ecosystem as it relates to our research institutions. Illinois University students and faculty produced a record 804 startups from 2012 to 2016, which is nearly a 100% increase from 2009 to 2013. And the capital raised by these startups has surged to $630 million from $345 million over that same period. We're also partnering with scientists at Argonne National Lab and Fermilab to launch companies here in the city, in Chicago. For those that don't know, the Chevy Volt's battery contains Argonne technology, making it safer, longer lasting, and more powerful. Our partnership with these labs focused on developing and commercializing groundbreaking technology in the areas of advanced analytics and materials, such as the cathode materials that determine how much power the Volt's battery can hold. So what's next? In the coming weeks, if not days, I look forward to announcing more details about how our partnership with Argonne, Fermi, and other Illinois universities will impact faculty, students, and Chicago's larger tech community. And thanks to a gift from the Duchess Hua family, we're investing $100 million in a new kind of biomedical science that could lead to new cures and companies. We're also designing new university policies that are innovation friendly. Policies that will encourage more faculty and researchers to collaborate with peers in applied disciplines such as engineering, computer science, and business. 
We're making it easier to start and build a business here. Today, I want to leave you with a far bolder vision for what's possible in Chicago. I believe Chicago will lead the cure for cancer. It's personal for me. Just two years ago, at age 15, my son Tim was diagnosed with a rare pediatric cancer. Thanks to chemotherapy drugs and surgery at Lurie, and it turns out the world's leading expert on his type of rare cancer right here at Northwestern, Tim's a survivor and in the audience today. <laughs> but we're not done. As we know, many are affected by this. We've got to go at it. The University of Chicago is currently investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the next generation of cancer research, hopefully leading to new treatments and new companies that can bring them to the marketplace and cure patients like Tim. One of the biggest challenges in fighting cancer has been that the cancer cells find ways of becoming invisible to the body's defenses. And the immune system can't kill what it can't see. So researchers at the University of Chicago are doing two things. First, they're using supercomputers far more advanced than the ones that my father built. They're identifying which kinds of cells our immune systems need to kill. And through the use of new drugs that they're developing, they're working to stimulate our immune system to spot them and attack. And that attack must occur at the molecular level, which should send you right back to the Institute for Molecular Engineering and the work the Polsky Center is doing to get cures and ideas to market. I started this speech by saying that the work being done at the Polsky Center is critical to transforming our regional economy. I'm closing by saying that over the next two decades, the work we're doing will be critical to transforming and even saving lives. That's the Polsky Center's mission, to go from idea all the way to impact. And we're betting long on the idea that entrepreneurship is the way to get to our desired impact, rebuilding the engine of Chicago's economy. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, John, and thank you, Caitlin and John and Mia for your comments and presentation. We have a number of questions here, and if you haven't uh, written a question out and turned it in, but you have something on your mind, this is the time. Just hold it up, and a member of our staff, Amanda and some other members of our staff, will come by and pick them up. Okay, John, the very first question from Peter Scozzi, who's over here, Director of Governmental Relations for the BNSF Railroad. Thanks for sharing your story. I feel your pain. He hates the guy with the fake mustache, too. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. So what's the question? Yeah. <laughs> There's no question on that one. <laughs> Okay, this is from Mike J. Dubensky. Michael, where are you? Straight back. Okay. He just became a member of the Polsky program. I understand you have a 3D maker lab. Does that mean I could get a cast of my hands? That's some very unusual questions today. If you can make it on the 3D printer, then yes, you can. Uh, we do have a 3D printer in the makerspace. The uh, Fab Lab, as we call it, uh, helps our entrepreneurs build prototypes using state-of-the-art equipment, 3D printing capabilities, laser cutters, all kinds of machines that allow one uh, to build things like casts, uh, simulated organs, uh, new kinds of uh, uh, furniture. It's a range of uh, new kinds of ideas that are being developed using 3D printing technology. So my answer would be yes, come on by, and we'll give it a try. So that's 53rd and Harper over in Hyde Park, so you can find your way there. Great. Um, 
So those were two closed-ended questions, sort of. Here we have one that's much more open-ended, John. Uh, this is from Justin Ullman. Justin, where are you? Okay, I see you checked. You're not a member of City Club. We want to change that. Okay. What does the Polsky Center need from Chicago business leaders? A number of things. The first is by being aware of the things that we're doing at the University of Chicago, getting involved by mentoring, by providing access. Everything we talked about here today is about connections. It's about creating a pathway into the market. There's no value for the Polsky Center if it's not working with faculty, students, and entrepreneurs and connecting them to the pathway that they don't currently understand how to get on. So business leaders play a special role in helping the Polsky Center connect to the community through mentoring and connections. Um, I also think that uh, the business community will benefit, obviously, from that participation because new talent, new ideas, new technologies are bubbling out of the university and so it can be uh, a win-win scenario. The last piece I would say is by being aware of what we're doing and realizing that more opportunities are happening near campus in our new 270,000 square foot facility, there's a home for you. Larger companies need to co-locate near this talent near the companies, near the work that we're doing. And now in the future, we'll have a space for you to do that. So please come down and live and work in Hyde Park. Great, I'll tell you, we have some great questions here, John, to tribute to you and to your colleagues here. Several of them look like they were written by the same person almost, but that's great. Okay, this is uh, from Soren uh, Spickhall, who's with Microsoft. Soren, where are you? Okay, uh, how does the Polsky Center see its role in the promotion of data science work in Chicago, especially as it relates to civic and social good? The Polsky Center plays a critical role in connecting um, all of the work that's happening on campus in uh, what I would what I'd call advanced analytics or data sciences. The broader Chicago community is rich with talent in data science, and data science really is uh, a critical type of capability uh, that we have built in here in our labor pool in Chicago. And the University of Chicago has particular strength in, in this regard in training data scientists and in attracting faculty that are world renowned in being able to understand how to apply that data to all different types of business verticals, including civics. So a lot of the things that are happening in the crime lab, uh, people like Brett Goldstein uh, um, um, and, and others, uh, we have an individual, Raid Ghani, that runs our data sciences for social good platform, which brings in 800 students uh, every summer uh, to go at and solve civic problems in urban environments like Chicago. Uh, so we're practicing that. Where Polsky gets engaged is connecting those ideas to the business landscape. And so that's our special role in tying this new talent to the marketplace and solving those types of problems in civic engagement. Thank you very much, John. Uh, this is from Dr. Suzette McKinney of the Illinois Medical District, our speaker early in September. Um, John, what do you think are the greatest barriers and greatest opportunities for creating the critical mass in entrepreneurship, economic growth, and scientific discovery that we need here in Chicago? Well, Chicago has always been blessed uh, with all of the raw ingredients required to have a robust STEM-based community, meaning companies that can uh, build their platform on some type of scientific technology. Um, we've got great universities. We've got the national laboratories. Um, there is capital. In the past, that's been late stage private equity capital, but that's changing. As the environment has changed post 2008, we see a lot of new venture capital firms coming in and investing in early stage. So we've got the capital. I think one of the biggest differences that's catalyzing um, uh, the push in this direction and Finally, the coming together of all those ingredients that always existed here in Chicago 
has been the recession, the crisis. The crisis has aligned universities getting talent to the market, um, companies trying to get access to new ideas in an environment where one entrepreneur uh, can knock down a whole industry. And so when we think about sciences, one of the missing ingredients that I think we've had that we're hopefully addressing with uh, our new Wexford uh, Science Technology Park initiative uh, would be uh, lab infrastructure. Um, now that we have that lab infrastructure and we are illuminating the pathway for these individuals who haven't done this before, um, we now have all the ingredients that we need to be successful um, in this community to be able to be uniquely positioned uh, to grow a, a scientific um, ecosystem well beyond where it currently exists today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> This is from uh, Danica Gordon, who's with Be Good Communications. And her question is, how can innovation initiatives be used to include support, engage, empower members of marginalized communities, particularly on the south and west sides of Chicago? Well, I think when you think about innovation and entrepreneurship, um, it doesn't, it, it discriminates against everyone. Uh, the barriers uh, are very high, but everybody has a fair shot at that process if you're providing access. With the rise of places like the Polsky Center, Blue 1647, 1871, Matter, we're creating new portals that individuals that want to get on this path can participate and move their idea forward in a manner that allows them to succeed as innovators and entrepreneurs. I believe that the work we're doing at the Polsky Exchange is already bearing fruit. Um, of the 3,500 members that we have at Polsky, 20% come from the community, most of whom are from the surrounding zip codes. And we're very diverse. So nine of our 18 uh, incubator companies are led by a woman founder. Uh, and we have 49% uh, of our population is underrepresented populations including 24% representation from the African American community. I think providing access, and every rule around entrepreneurship and innovation is just making it as easy as possible. Lowering every barrier you possibly can. Providing the space, providing the capital, providing the access to the mentors, um, and, and, and coaching and encouragement, and recognizing that entrepreneurship is an iterative process, and failure is part of it. And in marginalized communities, it's very important to uh, recognize that uh, failure should be celebrated on that pathway getting to success. And so I think the more we make ourselves available and make it easy and lower the barriers, the more likely we'll see broader participation. We have to work harder at it. I think we're on the right track of, of beginning that process. Well, John's been handling these questions, you know, like he's batting cleanup. Just Hits them right out of the park. You're probably a little thirsty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Was this your water? Am I drinking? No, no, I hope it's yours. <laughs> if not, we'll send you over to that cluster bio fellow. He'll, ta he'll take care of things. <laughs> Caitlin and Mia, et cetera. <clears throat> That's your water. So were you a golden eagle or a, it's not PC anymore, but a warrior I'm when a you warrior. were at Marquette? Okay. Good. We have a lot of Marquette people here, including our president, Jay Doherty. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Judy Thornber, who's a City Club member, Judy Thornber and Associates. It's a really good question. And I'm going to expand on it, if you don't mind, Judy. Um, what has Governor Rauner and the Democratic legislature done to encourage entrepreneurship in Illinois? So we made it a bipartisan question. Boy, it sure was nice having that trumpet player open up the ceremony today, wasn't it? <laughs> um, Governor Rauner uh, and Mayor Emanuel, for that matter, and Governor Quinn before uh, Governor Rauner have been strong supporters of the entrepreneurial and technology community. Um, obviously, we're living in difficult times with regards to the things that are happening in the state of Illinois. Uh, all of us believe that the state of Illinois has um, a bright future if we put our heads together. I offered a couple comments around my belief that uh, the cure to all these 
uh, challenges, um, and I'm certain I'm oversimplifying this, is good old fashioned entrepreneurship, grit, and taking things forward so that the, so that the state and the city have more income to cover the demands and the costs and the supports that we need in all these other areas that we desperately need to address. So from the standpoint of uh, optics, support, and trying to row in the same direction, um, all of these government leaders uh, have been huge proponents, champions, and cheerleaders to helping uh, draw and retain companies in the technology ecosystem. And uh, it would behoove us to continue to let them know how important uh, those aspects to our uh, corporate regrowth uh, will happen over the next several years and support them in that sense. Okay, thank you. With just a couple more questions. This is from Matt McCormick with U.S. Trust. Matt, where are you? Back there? Great. Um, John, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself 20 years ago and do differently if you could? I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> Great answer. Okay. Um, I have two questions here. Um, this is from Andrew Ettenhofer with Coalition. Andrew, where are you? Okay, he's also back there. Uh, what's the biggest barrier for social enterprises and impact startups, in your opinion? And what do you think we should do about it? Well, I think social enter enterprises uh, have the same challenges that for-profit ventures face. And the entrepreneurs and visionaries that lead them have the same challenges. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, obviously different markets, different motivations, uh, and, and yet the same challenges exist. If I'm trying to build a technology company, um, I have to be able to uh, uh, convince talent to come to my company. I need to be able to find the right facilities. I need to be able to raise capital, and I need to be able to solve a problem. Same thing for a social venture. You're, you've identified a problem. There's a market opportunity. Provided that that is real and legitimate, and someone needs your product or your mission or your idea, you will face those same challenges. There are now available to you today more mechanisms to get your social venture idea to the market because there are more funds more uh, social impact investors. You have a wealth of new talent that are very attractive to uh, social ventures, whether it's for uh, uh, a company that's in the for-profit world. Think about this generation. Civic duty is being encapsulated inside of the company that they work for. They're not two separate things. It's not go to work for the industrial company, and then on the side, you provide your civic duty. It's all one thing. So. When you think about uh, the, the challenges that exist for social impact, they're the same as what you see for a for-profit venture. And the needs and the ingredients are almost identical. Uh, but the reality is that um, there's a warmer environment to bring those ideas to the market um, and also a greater appetite and aptitude by an up-and-coming generation of leaders that want to participate in that type of venture. And that certainly is happening in a big way here in Chicago, and will continue to scale because um, those ventures are solving big challenges that address our city, our states, uh, and our country's needs. Very good. Our final question, and it comes from uh, Pete Scozzi, who started us off. He was the engine that got this started, and now he's like, though they don't have him anymore, the caboose. Um, John. How have you seen the venture capital market change for biotech startups in the last five years? Uh, I think the, the biotech venture capital market uh, nationally is, is very robust. Um, you know, coming out of the nuclear winter uh, that was, you know, 2000 to 2010, uh, where a lot of those firms dried up, um, uh, there's been a robust uh, biotech environment in the last uh, four to five years, uh, led by uh, great activity across the country and uh, mergers and acquisition uh, and IPOs that have allowed exits for those venture firms that have gone on to raise larger and la larger amounts of money. 
most of those funds and firms are uh, on the coast, uh, in places that are uh, uh, around MIT, around Stanford, um, around Harvard, uh, in those types of places. Now, in Chicago, led by uh, things that are happening in the digital tech scene, first with the success of Groupon, Kiwal and Lefkowski moving to build Lightbank, um, moving out of their next ventures now. Um, mm -hmm. Firms like Chicago Ventures and Kevin Willer uh, are building and supporting and raising funds to invest in digital ventures. I'm seeing them begin to cross over into healthcare here in Chicago. That's been a missing ingredient um, in getting to where we are right now uh, with regards to capital. We've always had angel, we've always had private equity. We need more in between. It's a lot more available, capital is a lot more available to digital tech entrepreneurs, becoming a lot more available to health tech entrepreneurs in Chicago from angel through series A. Um, and that's a big reason why our endowment wants to play in that market too, investing in series A rounds in these types of ventures. By the way, when the endowment invests, it has to co-invest with a uh, venture capital firm. The goal there is to try to bring in the flagship ventures, the Sequoias from the coast that would co-invest here. And that might help us see more venture capital investing in later rounds that we currently lack in today's environment. So provided that the markets continue to stay healthy, I would expect to see more funds available to invest in places like Chicago under the condition that there are investable ventures that we're putting in place here. And what I hope that I've shown you today is that we are. There's investable opportunities and more are coming. And the more we invest in this infrastructure and create the super highway into the market, the more likely it is we will draw more and more uh, funds into biotech investment opportunity here. Well, let's give uh, John Flavin and <laughs>